Um, welcome to the uh, third day of um, Atva uh, 2020. Um, um, and so, um, as always, our first session of the day is um, our keynote speaker. And in the spirit of uh, saving uh, best for last, uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. David Deal. Um, um, uh, Dr. Deal had um, a, a long distinguished uh, career um, at uh, Stanford University uh, before uh, leaving it in 2017 and moving to Facebook. Um, uh, he is, has working has been working on uh, lots of uh, different uh, problems related to formal verification, uh, both software and hardware, um, uh, uh, on also related things such as um, uh, security of of electronic voting, um, and uh, mo uh, most recently uh, he has been. Uh, uh, contributing to the blockchain uh, projects at, at Facebook, and I'm very excited that he'll be able to tell us uh, about the form of verification of uh, Libra blockchain, or, or or the move language for Libra uh, blockchain. So, uh, thanks for being here, and uh, David, uh, take it away. Um, I'm honored to be invited to speak here about the work that we're doing at Novi Financial on verification. Um, so um, this is a project that's been going on for a couple of years, but we've really gotten serious about implementing at the beginning of this year. Much of the work I'll describe today was done by uh, the people on this uh, slide. Um, the top row are basically working full time in the project and have been most of the year. Um, the second row are people who are working on other projects, a consultant and a uh, uh, intern, all of whom have contributed significantly to uh, what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll mention that I've done a couple of keynotes in the last year uh, with a similar title, or probably the same title, uh, but um, if you saw one of those, I hope there will be enough new material in this. We've accomplished a lot in the last few months, and uh, a lot of the technical material has, has changed significantly since the last time I did a keynote. Um, so, and by way of motivation, one of the many lessons I've learned working in formal verification is formal verification is hard. And so if you want to use it, you should find an application that really needs it. One of those applications is blockchain. So blockchain is a high assurance system. Billions of dollars are involved in them. We're hoping that Libra will be a big one and uh, we'll have a lot of assets on it. So, of course, these large assets are at stake. Uh, transactions are costly to reverse. The blockchain is supposed to be, uh, you do something, it's done, and it's done forever. And uh, things can be reversed, but uh, not without, without great cost. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm having a little problem with a stuck, uh, oh man. Let's see if this, uh, okay, good. Uh, my PowerPoint was stuck there for a second. Um, so a blockchain may be targeted by highly motivated, well-resourced adversaries, even nation states. And uh, smart contracts on the blockchain already have a pretty bad track, rack, track record. There's been at least a billion dollars in losses because of bugs on other blockchains uh, at this point. Probably there will be more. So I'll be talking about the Move Prover, which is a formal verifier uh, for smart contracts on the Libra blockchain. It's a work in progress. So uh, a year from now, I hope it'll be a lot different and a lot better than it is now. But I think it's uh, an interesting project and it's interesting to talk about it in its current state. I'm also treating it as an engineering project not primarily as a as a research project. So our goal is to get something done and accomplish a task. And I think we'll be doing some research that we'll be able to publish as part of that. But the research is a side effect, not the main goal. 
Um, the system is 100% open source, and so you can go look at it in GitHub, though wait till after the talk is finished. Um, so the aspirations of the, the project, and I say them because they haven't yet been completely achieved, are to allow complete specification of the functional properties of smart contracts, enable fully automatic verification that the implementations meet their specifications. Um, the verifier should run only a little, little bit slower than a, a compiler would, and we should be able to re-verify uh, the specifications after every change in the code or the specifications, either interactively or in continuous integration. One of the things I've learned in industry is every time you check in changes to your source code, they run a bunch of tests in the background, and uh, it's very important that those tests not be flaky and that they be able to finish uh, fairly quickly. So we want to run verification as part of that process. So this has been a and I'd like to reflect on why. Um, we're starting with a clean slate, so we, we're not trying to verify C++ or the Linux operating system or something like that. We can start fresh. Uh, because of that, we can avoid many of the problems with verifying traditional software. And these are really, really hard problems. So one of them is developers hate to write specifications. They don't even want to write assertions in the code many times. Uh, the programming languages are very complex and sometimes ill-defined. Uh, programs are too big and complex. And unfortunately, people don't even care that much about bugs a lot of the time, even when they really should. They don't care about them until it's too late. So we're in a situation where we've got a new programming language, we've got small programs for now, and we can co-design our tools the programming style, the language, the verification methodology all together to optimize the chance for success. And so I think, uh, you know, anybody, and there are a lot of people in the audience who've struggled a lot with trying to apply verification tools in industry, and uh, you know how difficult it is. So it's, it's nice to have a combination of factors like this that doesn't make the problem easy, but at least increases the chances for success. So here's an outline of the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about some background, including what are Libra and Novi. I'll talk about the Libra blockchain. I'll talk about the Move language. Then I'll talk about the Move Prover, the tool we're developing. And I'll talk about using the Move Prover. And then I'll have some concluding remarks. So Libra is uh, basically a financial infrastructure. You can think of it sort of like, uh, by analogy, as a highway system. It's infrastructure that everybody can use. And then Novi is uh, Facebook's application, applications which will run on the blockchain. So many different companies we hope will be writing applications to run on the blockchain and will be one of them. And so we're developing this infrastructure and making it open source so that everybody can use it, including us. So the Libra blockchain serves as a foundation for financial services on the network. Um, we're using blockchain technology rather than a database because of the important advantages it has over traditional financial infrastructure. Those include distributed governance uh, so that no single entity, including Facebook, can control the blockchain, open access, and security that's built into the whole system through cryptography. So the blockchain has been built from the ground up because existing blockchain infrastructure didn't meet our needs, and we're prioritizing scalability, security, efficiency in storage, and in throughput, as well as flexibility for changes in the future. So the Libra Association is an independent governing group uh, for the Libra blockchain. So Novi is one of the members, but there are many other members. Uh, I guess there are 27 at the moment. We are hoping that number will grow, uh, and I expect that it will. And they include everybody from other companies that want to use the blockchain uh, for uh, financial applications um, to actually nonprofits that want um, financial services in the third world. So, um, Novi is a reasonable size organization, and within it, there's a research organization uh, of which I am a member. 
So the reason we have a research organization is that the technology we're developing requires research breakthroughs. Blockchains are very new. There are many challenging problems that are not yet solved or that could be solved better than they, they have been. And we need to feel that we need researchers in order to address those problems. We have a number of senior and junior researchers in relevant areas, including cryptography and privacy, formal methods, distributed algorithms, and uh, or formal methods for uh, smart contracts, distributed algorithms, and critical systems code, and ways of overcoming centralization barriers and consensus. For example, new proof of work, proof of authority schemes, etc. Also, we have to build systems that scale to many, many users and have high capacity. So the twin goals of Novi Research, first is to impact Novi. And so that means that we'll be able to engage in deep and meaningful interaction with Novi development teams and Facebook at large that will have and already have had substantial impact on Novi technology and that will be creating differentiating technology that impacts Novi or Facebook. We also expect to impact the field. And so we hope, like any good research lab, to be publishing in top tier venues and uh, engaging with the scientific community and to lead an independent research agenda and become a recognized uh, leader in the relevant domains. OK, so now you know who we are, basically, and what we're doing, the big picture. So I'd like to talk about the Libra blockchain. Um, a blockchain uh, can be thought of abstractly as a sequence of states with um, transactions that move from one state to the next. Um, I'm very used to this. I started with linear temporal, lo temporal logic in grad school. Um, so a smart contract is the code that um, executes a transaction. Uh, smart contracts are sometimes identified with legal contracts in the literature, but the way the word is used now, it's really just a program that changes the state of the blockchain. And transactions are atomic, so they either run to completion, resulting in a new state, or they abort and don't change the state at all, except for consuming a little bit of resources to pay for the computation. So we have a permissioned Byzantine consensus scheme. Um, blockchains always have to have consensus algorithms because they need decentralized control uh, over the uh, the creation of the blockchain. Um, so Bitcoin uh, does this in an unpermissioned scheme. So anybody can do Bitcoin mining. And it has a proof of work consensus method, which is based on who can solve computational a computational puzzle first. That's kind of random. And so it depends on who has the most computer power. Uh, it's extremely wasteful. So um, it burns massive amounts of energy and it's, I think uh, my personal opinion, uh, it's, it's not ethical environmentally to use proof of work in that way. Libra, on the other hand, use a, uses a permissioned scheme. So we have multiple organizations working together to maintain the blockchain, but they're only association members. In the future, they may be a larger group, but they'll have to be granted permission to participate. <coughs> in the consensus algorithm, something called Libra BFT which is a leader-based Byzantine fault-tolerant uh, agreement algorithm. And so um, Libra BFT has um, a bunch of persistent, the computers that participate in the consensus are called validator nodes. Um, the validators have to agree on which transactions to execute and the order in which they're executed. And it tolerates Byzantine faults, uh, which are arbitrary faults. They could even be malicious. You could have your worst enemy controlling some number of validators, and it would still uh, do the right thing, as long as fewer than one third of those validators are con are controlled <coughs> are faulty or controlled by adversaries. However, you want to think of it. So the Libra blockchain state, just you know, will be we'll need to know this later on in the talk. Looks something like this. Yeah, it's a tree. And the top of the tree is a collection of many, many addresses. There's, I think, 160-bit address space. Each address can have a, um, instances of a single type stored at it. So, for example, in our blockchain, 
um, an address can have um, something called a Libra account, which is a record, and it has several fields. Two of those fields are an authentication key, which is basically just a vector of bytes, and a sequence number, which is a 64-bit number. There are other fields as well that I'm not showing. So in this case, the um, Libra account is associated with address number two. You can have uh, lots of different types, uh, lots of different types that are stored at an address. And so at the moment, we have um, something called a balance, which holds money. Uh, in this case, I've got a currency called Coin One. The, the, balance the balance record has a balance field, which contains another record, uh, which is a uh, coin one with a wrapper. There's a generic type parameter here, but it's basically a coin one. And the coin one has a value, which is the denomination of the coin. That's how much money it contains. So there can be several different currencies stored. So we also have uh, something called LBR, <coughs> which uh, is in the, in the current code. And so it's another coin of a different type, but it has the same things. It has a balance and the balance has a value, which is the denomination of that different currency. So the key thing to remember here is that a blockchain state is a tree and the top of the tree is addresses. The first layer of the tree after that consists of um, zero or one records of uh, each type and each record can have uh, is a tree in its own because it can have fields that have records inside them. So now I'll talk about the move programming language that we've developed. So the move language is a programming language for implementing smart contracts in the Libra blockchain. Uh, move is designed for safety. Uh, modules can only call modules that already exist. Um, there are no re-interesty issues, and I mention that because there have been horrible ones in some other blockchain languages uh, that have caused losses of billions of millions of dollars anyway. Um, and uh, there's a resource type uh, to model physical assets and move. This is the most novel feature. So it's a kind of record that cannot be lost or duplicated, uh, otherwise known as a linear type for type theorists. And Move, at least for now, has limited expressive power. And as verification people, we all love uh, languages with limited expressive power. The less expressive it is, the easiest, easier it is to verify. So let's talk about resources, which are the most novel aspect of Move. A resource is a record that can't be copied and can only be created and deleted in the module that defines it. So it's a linear type, and uh, it's uh, appropriate for representing assets. That's why we put it in the language, such as tokens and a currency, because you want to be able to move them around between people, exchange them, et cetera, but you don't want to create or destroy them uh, unless you're the central bank or something. And uh, But now that we have resources, they may be useful for other things, such as non-copyable capabilities for use in access control. We're still experimenting with these ideas. Um, so move compiles like pretty much in any language. You have a move program, you input it to a compiler, it produces bytecode. We've designed a special bytecode for this purpose. So the bytecode verifier is not a formal verifier, but the stan it's standard terminology from Java and other languages, and it does semantic checks on the bytecode. The advantage of that, uh, such as type checking, borrow checking, et cetera, the advantage of that is we don't have to trust the compiler to do these checks. It reduces the size of the trusted computing base. So the code that is critical for the correctness of the system does not include the compiler itself because we check the bytecode just uh, for types and things like that. So in our system, all of the transaction logic is implemented in Move. So there's a store that stores all of the states in the blockchain. And uh, that is read and written by the virtual machine. So all of the changes in the store have to go through the virtual machine. And those are directed by transaction scripts, which are sent to the blockchain from clients. And the transaction scripts are move programs. And they can call other move functions that are defined in standard in the standard library that's uh, already on the blockchain. 
So all of the basic functionality in the blockchain is implemented with smart contracts. For example, the currency, uh, including the native currency, are all implemented with smart contracts. Uh, accounts, in order to keep your currency, are implemented as smart contracts. And uh, we maintain a list of the validators that are part currently participating in consensus, and that's maintained with Move on the blockchain as well. Okay, so uh, that's just background, so you can understand what the Move Prover is is working on. And so now I'll start talking about the Prover itself. Um, so we use a classical approach, basically Floyd, Ho Floyd Hoare, and we expect users to write specifications, um, lots of them, in fact. So the specifications are mathematically precise. They're written in a logical language. They're separate from the code. And uh, their go the goal of the specifications is to explicitly capture the user intent or the programmer's intent. So the specifications say what the code is supposed to do, and then verification checks that it actually does what it's supposed to do. For, um, <clears throat> for all possible inputs and all possible states. So, and this is this is important, even though it sounds obvious. Our goal is to prove correctness, not to hunt for bugs. So I learned very early in my career that it's much more impressive when you're doing formal verification to find a bug in somebody's code than to prove the code is correct, because whoever wrote the code thinks it's correct to begin with, and so they're much more surprised, if not pleased, to discover there's a bug than to have their belief confirmed that it's correct. But in this case, what we want is confidence in the code. So we're not evaluated on how many bugs we're fi we find. We're evaluated on how much confidence we have in the code after we've verified it. We expect we'll find some bugs too, and we have. Um, so specification. Um, <clears throat> I realize that although verification is computationally hard, and that's a problem I've worked on a lot, that the problems with specification may be the hardest practical problems in formal verification. So errors in specification are dangerous. Um, one, if you have false positives, which I define as bogus error reports, they're annoying and they require they waste they consume time by requiring you to debug the spec. But false positives are maybe not so bad because you at least know you have an error. The really scary thing, if your goal is to prove that things are correct, are false negatives. So false negatives are missed errors, which could be security vulnerabilities. And in that case, you don't even know that you have a problem. And so depends on how you can make your specifications complete, which is a question we don't know how to answer at this time. So the goal with our specification language is to enable users to write specifications in the most obviously correct form. We have some other thinking about specification completeness, but the first basic thing is just to make sure the specifications are easily readable and writable, at least by experts. So one thing we do in order to make them easy to write is we use quantifiers very freely. Now quantifiers are problematic when you have an SMT-based you know, decision procedure because you're dealing with logic that's no longer decidable and uh, that has some consequences. But it works well enough and the advantage of being able to use them in specifications, the advantage in clarity we think has uh, justified using quantifiers. So here's a bit of a diagram of the system as it currently exists. Um, we um, generate bytecodes for the move compiler. Um, we translate into Boogie, uh, which is I'll talk about in a moment. It's a program from Microsoft Research. It's kind of an intermediate language for um, verification. We generate SMT uh, log format uh, to be processed by Z3 or CVC4. Right now, we primarily use Z3. And then if um, their Z3 finds a counterexample, we process that to try to produce something that's understandable by a user so they can debug whatever the problem was. So let's talk about Boogie a bit. Uh, it's a verification intermediate language that sits between the source code of your program, in this case Move, and um, an SMT solver. It's um, a little difficult, we found, and as many other people have found, to go directly from a programming language to logic. And so these intermediate languages are quite useful. Y3 is another one of them. Um, so 
Boogie looks approximately like a simple imperative language, even though it's really an abbreviation for logic. It has procedures, it has uh, imperative assignment to variables, and it has data structures that are the kinds of things you see in SMT solvers. So the problem we have is how to translate a bytecode program to Boogie. Our approach for doing this is to implement each bytecode instruction as a procedure. And then when you translate a bytecode program, you end up translating it into a sequence of procedure calls. So um, a specification, uh, specifications translate into a combination of Boogie code and assumptions and assertions in Boogie. So Boogie has its own specification language. So we translate it into assumptions and assertions in those logical formulas. OK, so um, I'll talk about the memory model that we've devised, which is one of the more interesting aspects of the move prover at this time. So one of the biggest problems you have when you try to verify um, software is aliasing. So um, this creates major efficiency challenges. And so the problem is when you're reasoning about memory updates, you have to consider whether runtime memory locations are the same location or distinct locations. And you might have a lot of memory locations so that you're reasoning about. And so that means there's often a combinatorial explosion of possible aliasing relationships and your <clears throat> solver or theorem prover or whatever has to deal with all of those possibilities. So for example, uh, a lot of people will try to model computer memory as an array in SMTs. Um, and uh, what happens when you do that is you end up with deeply nested array expressions that inside the solver will expand out to massive if then else trees, which are needed in order to cover all the possible pairs of locations that might be equal or not equal. Um, so I've suffered a lot personally from having to deal with this. And uh, so one way or another, there's high cost to dealing with aliasing which is no surprise to people who've worked on either static analysis or formal verification of software. So we found somewhat to our surprise that we don't have this problem in Move because of the unique semantics of the language. So memory in Move is tree structured, as I've shown you. And Move has references, it has pointers, but they're very restricted. So first of all, they can only be stored temporarily on the stack as local variables or parameters to procedures. But we also have a static checker um, that um, has to be uh, has to be has that the bytecode has to pass before it can be executed, which strictly forbids combinations of references that result in the possibility of aliasing. So I won't go through the the precise conditions it guarantees or how it works because that's a little bit subtle. But uh, the important thing to know is that it prevents aliasing from from being a problem. And so essentially, we can pretend that the language has copy semantics, even though it has references and it has the con some of the convenience that references give you. So in other words, move is a refer referentially transparent. So here's how we take advantage of this fact in the move prover. We basically treat um, references, changes to memory through mutable references as copy in, copy out parameters to a function. So let's imagine that we have one of these trees. So this is a piece of our state, which I'll call T1, and that we've got a reference, a mutable reference to some subtree there. So you've got a record of record of records, and one of the records inside here has a mutable reference to it, which is totally allowed in uh, move. And then let's imagine that we have a function that takes that mutable reference as an argument. Well, normally you'd have a lot of aliasing problems, so that function can modify um, the uh, things in T2, and uh, other things could be modified at the same time, and you'd have a mess. But what we can do in the move prover, and I'll mention that this is like the third iteration of the memory model, so it took us some real time to figure out how to do this, is we can just pretend that that tree is copied by value into F, F then does whatever it does to it, modifying it, and then um, we can that we copy the value back to the tree um, once F uh, is completes. So uh, the reason 
there's no aliasing is that nobody can observe, you know, the change actually occurred on the arrow that says modify subtree here but nobody can observe the change until after F is completed anyway. So it's functionally equivalent to copy semantics. Now this just um, saves a lot of complexity. It's a tricky to implement, but it saves massive amounts of complexity in the decision procedure. So the specific advantages are it actually eliminates the combinatorial explosion of aliasing possibilities that you get normally when you have uh, a C a model of memory and C almost any programming language. Um, it also simplifies framing, which is the need to specify the state that a function does not change, which becomes very obnoxious when you're writing a verifier for software. So this uh, um, didn't completely eliminate that problem, but made our life much better when we're running the verifier and made it much more efficient in practice. So now that I've talked a little bit about how the prover works, I'll talk about using it. So the main thing that we've used it for is the move standard library. So the move standard library provides reusable libraries, um, currency and payment functions, uh, and, and other sort of essential aspects of the, um, the blockchain, um, things you need for transactions. So uh, this is very important too. This is a, a strategy, a strategic decision we made. Our primary goal, we're developing a tool, but our primary goal was not to develop our tool. The first goal that we had is to actually produce a specified and verified version of the Move Standard Library. And uh, so we developed the tool and we made the decision that uh, since verification is hard, we would make a tool that was usable possibly only by experts, and then uh, use that tool to specify and verify the standard library. We thought we would learn so much in that process that we would then know how to improve the prover so that it could be used by regular developers, or at least regular developers who know some logic. And we think we're on that path, but right now we're working on specifying and verifying the move standard library, not on making a developer-friendly tool. So an example where we've we've done this that uh, is perhaps easier to explain than some of the other things we specified and verified is access control and move. So access control is answer, addresses the question of who can do what. And so more importantly, since it's about security, it's who, who's not allowed to do what. So by who, I mean an address which is authenticated with a digital signature. Um, I won't go into details about how that works. By what, it's a calling a particular function and or making a change in the state. So the idea is that's only allowed by, only certain addresses are allowed to do certain things. So the way we implement it is that every account has a role. And so the role determines the permissions of the account, what privileges it has. And uh, currently in the implementation, we have seven roles. So this is role-based access control, although it's a bit more complicated than that in practice. So the access control requirements were something we, uh, mostly other people than me, had to put a lot of thought into. And so in order to design these policies, it was a complicated process and there were multiple stakeholders. So they found that what they needed, to, the stakeholders were the authors of modules, association members and other interested parties. So what they found it was helpful to do was to actually just make a spreadsheet that summarized all our access control policies. You can actually go look at that. It's in the same, it's in GitHub uh, in a different repo, but in the same directory as the Libra code. So we decided that what we should do is prove all the requirements that are in that spreadsheet, specify and prove them. So I don't expect you to look, I don't want you to look at this. I just want to show it to you uh, because this is what the spreadsheet looks like. This is what one of the spreadsheets look like. This thing describes the, the seven roles um, that accounts can have in the system. And this is part of the second spreadsheet, which shows what the permissions that they have. And so just, you know, you can look at the texture of this without my going into detail. This is what we're working from. So, um, 
with that background, I'll now talk about the specification language a bit. So uh, remember the structure of a state here. The specification language has to talk about this state structure. So one of the things we want to ask, uh, so at a given address, you may or may not have a record of a particular type stored. And so the specification language has a way of querying whether or not that record is actually stored there. So if we want to know whether a Libra account is stored at address number two, we say exists angle bracket Libra account close angle uh, 0x2. Now exists here is not a quantifier. It's just stating that this thing is present. Um, and so it's got a Boolean value depending on whether it's present or absent. Another thing that we want to do is actually to access the values or refer to them in specifications. And so if we wanted to refer to the role ID of this role object here, um, we'd say global road I, role ID, which means the, the value in the global state at address 0x2, and then dot lowercase role underbar ID is the numerical value, which is a number between 0 and 6 in our implementation. So the simplest things we can specify are post conditions. And so suppose we have, as an example, a function publish parent VASP credential, which in fact we do have. I've just eliminated uh, all the arguments in the body of the function. Then um, our specifications would be enclosed in special blocks. So um, we separate the specifications from the co code. Right now they're in the same file, but they're not, uh, they're, they're, they don't generate instructions and they're not executed. They're just there for verification purposes. And so what this specification says, this is the post condition. This is a simplified version of what we actually said and have in the repository. It says that after you run publish parent VASP credential, there will exist a record of type parent VASP at the address that you is that was the argument to your function. And that the num children field of that parent VASP record will be equal to zero. So this is initially defining thing over time that num children field will change, but at the exact end of published parent VASP credential is zero. So this is very standard, including the use of the word ensures. It's just the logical expressions may look a different, little different from some languages. We have a related feature that's a little different called aborts if. So move programs abort instead of generating runtime errors or exceptions. And so an abort just cancels the entire transaction. So if you get an error that would normally be a runtime error, like an integer overflow or an out-of-bounds vector access, that causes an abort. It just cancels the transaction. And so there's no state change except that a little bit of money is consumed to pay for the computation. So programs are actually supposed to abort under some conditions. The correctness includes stating when the, the function is supposed to abort. And so we want our verifier not to report a uh, possible abort as an error uh, if it's, but uh, if it's expected. Um, an unexpected abort is an error or an abort that's expected to occur is an error. So, we want to say exactly what aborts are supposed to occur. And so we have a construct called aborts if, which is supposed to capture the programmer's expectations about when the code can abort. And then the verifier checks whether the code meets those expectations. So here's an example of an aborts if in access control. So we have a function called uh, create, uh, well, it creates an account with a parent VASP role. And so um, there is a rule in those spreadsheets somewhere that a parent VASP can only be created by an account that has a treasury compliance role. So it's a security requirement that only an account with a treasury compliance role is allowed to create something, another account with a parent VASP role. So we can specify this requirement by saying that create parent VASP account um, has to abort unless its role ID is, uh, it has to abort if the role ID is not equal to the code for the treasury compliance role. 
And so it gets global of the road. ID. It's looking at the role ID. That's the global at the address of the creator of the account uh, and then getting the role ID uh, numerical code and comparing that with the Treasury compliance code. Um, if it aborts, this uh, aborts if specification also says what the error code is. So it says it comes back with a requires role error code. So um, this is a kind of a unique thing and it's got good things and bad things. We're still working a little bit on this to see if it's in its final form. Probably more interesting than the specifications of individual functions are the global specifications. So a lot of the most important properties are global. So global specifications are things that involve multiple functions. They involve properties of the global state, so um, not locals and uh, parameters, and they involve change or the absence of change over time. So they're temporal properties in a sense. <clears throat> we don't have any temporal logic, but we can fake it in some ca important cases, which I'll show ex in an example. So the two kinds of uh, global properties we tend to use a lot are global invariants, which are properties that are guaranteed to be true for all time, starting with initialization, and two-state invariants, which are properties that compare the previous state to the current state, um, the state on entry to a function and the state on exit. So here's an example of a global invariant that's actually in the system. I've simplified and you know to uh, eliminate boilerplate and whatever, but this is something we actually check. So a particular address can have a Libra account um, object stored at it and a role ID object stored at it, as I've shown you before. And so we have a rule that says anytime you have a Libra account stored at a particular address, you must also have a role ID stored at the same address. And so all our account creation functions make sure that they create a role ID before they create the Libra account. <clears throat> so the way you write that in our syntax is you write it's a module specification and then uh, there's a global invariant. And what I've written here is for every address where there is a um, Libra account stored at that address, there is also a role ID stored at that address. So it's, if you know logic, at least, it's a fairly natural way to write this. And we are using quantifiers to show that it holds for every possible address. Um, so here's an example of a two-state invariant. And so we uh, use or abuse these to specify simple temporal properties. So an example might be, once a role ID is stored at an address, it never changes. So you can store it, but you can't delete it and you can't change it after that. So it's going to be there forever. And so we can write this with a two state invariant in the following form. Uh, for every address, if the role ID existed uh, at the address before the function call, then it continues to exist after the function call. And the value of the role ID field of that object uh, after the function call is equal to whatever the value was before the function call. So obviously, uh, on a state-by-state -state basis, once you create one of these role IDs, you can't delete it and according if it satisfies the specification, and you can't change the value in the role ID field. So we use these kinds of specifications a lot. Okay, um, I'll wrap up now and uh, make some concluding remarks on various topics. The current status of the project, it's actually uh, moved along fairly quickly. We're not going to say we're done uh, verifying the move standard library, but we've got it in reasonably good shape. Uh, we're a lot more confident than we were a few months ago. So we've written extensive specifications for the move standard library. Uh, we've got all of those access control properties that I showed you encoded somehow as specifications in many different uh, modules, and we've verified all of them. Um, we've also got a documentation generator, which is quite helpful. So it takes the comments in the code and the specifications and prepares a document that shows you the code and the various specifications along with explanations written by the programmer and specifier. Um, for specifications that ref 
that are um, implement are checking these uh, role based access control, they refer back to the lip two requirements in the spreadsheet. So there'll actually be a spreadsheet cell A6 or something like that for a particular requirement. Uh, next to the logic that uh, the logical specification for that requirement. So we can keep track of what we've checked. And of course, we have many other specifications besides the lib2 requirements. Um, there are a few specifications that we've tr had to disable because they, um, the verifier doesn't terminate consistently, but almost everything verifies automatically. And every module runs in less than 30 seconds. A lot of them will run in like two seconds. Um, formal verification is rerun every time we check in new code. And if you're curious, um, you can just go browse the repository and see it all. So that includes the library and specifications, which are in subdirectories of that directory, and the move prover source code and the documentation for it, including um, documentation for the specification language and for using the move prover. So in case you're excited about going off and applying it, uh, that might be a skill that requires some expertise. We're not supporting it or answering any significant questions for general use. Um, the tool is there for us to use <clears throat> right now to verify the uh, standard library. Um, we intend to make it, you know, we our goal is to have other people be able to develop move programs and verify them as well. But we're not there yet. We need to make a tool that's usable by people other than us, and maybe that'll happen next year. The system is also rapidly evolving. So if um, you know if I'm speaking next year or something, or you get a chance to use the tool after a while, it'll probably be somewhat different from what I'm describing and hopefully a lot better. OK, I should mention that there are some similar projects with similar aims. So one of them is Verisol, which is at Microsoft Research, uh, SolC, Verify at SRI. Both of these use Boogie, I believe. And uh, Sertora, which is a uh, Muli Sagiv startup, which is using proprietary technology, but it's still verifying smart contracts and is using SMT-based solving in order to do that. Um, the similarities between these systems and what we've done are that they're verifying smart contracts on a blockchain and they're SMT based. The important difference is that they're working on a different blockchain since we made a new one ourselves. So they're based on uh, the Solidity language and the Ethereum blockchain, which is a very different environment than what we're doing. And uh, I think maybe they have a harder job in some ways. Speaking of hard jobs, um, we all like problems uh, since we're researchers, so I wanted to mention some of the problems we have. Uh, debugging failed verifications is definitely a big problem that researchers don't necessarily uh, want to focus on, but I think it's actually worth focusing on. So when you're writing specifications, most verification runs fail because mostly the specifications are wrong until you get them debugged. Most of the user time goes into diagnosing and fixing these problems, and we've actually put quite a lot of work on this. We're proud about what we've done, but there's more that needs to be done. And one of the problems is how do you generate counterexamples for formulas with quantifiers? If you say for all X something or another and it's not true, you'd like to know what X has the exception where that formula what didn't hold. And uh, it would be great if Boogie or some similar program and SMT solvers had better support for debugging. Another problem is efficiency and reliability. So this has been a central focus verification forever, and you, you all know about it, maybe we have a slightly different angle on it. So we have problematic constructs. So we've decided to use quantifiers, and that's painful. So it results in a lot of unpredictability and performance, although Z3 is like magically good at dealing with them most of the time. Um, also, integer arithmetic, including even linear integer arithmetic, sometimes causes problems. Uh, so one problem with systems of this kind is that small logical changes can often result in massive changes in runtime, which can be frustrating, and it's a bit different from what happens with uh, executable code. Uh, what we find is that if you make a mistake in a specification, the verification also doesn't often doesn't terminate, which is super frustrating because that means you don't get anything you can use to debug your mistake. Um, what we've also found is that when you have 
correct specs, sometimes you have unpredictable timeouts. So it works great on your computer, but then you try using it in continuous integration when you check in your code and it fails. Or uh, somebody changes something else and it fails on them, even though they didn't change something that was related to your test. This is a real problem for continuous integration. We've uh, reduced it to the point where things work pretty well now, but it's going to continue to be a problem, and it would be great if we could figure out how to solve it. So my main point here is that we all worry about whether we can verify things or not. We have benchmarks, you know, things like SMT Comp, where we run things on benchmarks and uh, try to see who can do the most of them. But being reliably efficient is maybe is at least as important as just being able to be efficient some of the time and solve problems sometimes. Uh, Z3, we find, behaves very unpredictably, possibly unnecessarily unpredictably, although we haven't gotten to the bottom of it. There are huge differences in runtime depending on the order of input declarations to Boogie. And I found a case where uh, there's a huge variation runtime just based on the length of the name of the file that you're verifying. You have exactly the same contents, different name, and it either terminates or finishes, doesn't terminate or finishes in two seconds, depending. Um, and as already mentioned, the specification development is hard. Uh, we have the question of where requirements come from. The processes they use in avionics and whatever are incredibly expensive, so we don't we can't really do that. But we need some way of eliciting requirements besides just looking at the code. How do you know if your requirements are complete? It's a problem we don't really know how to solve. We've gotten partway there, but uh, I don't know of any research that uh, can really help you with that, except maybe mutation testing. Um, and how do you prevent making a mistake where your specification doesn't actually say something useful? This is really really scary. So, for example, if you have an inconsistent set of axioms, then everything is provable, um, uh, but you notice this, and so this can cause real panic. Or if you have an implication and the antecedent happens to be false, um, then the consequent is always true, which is a smaller scale version of the previous problem, uh, and that can also be annoying. So I think there could actually be a whole research problem in assuring the quality of specifications. And I think we'll be doing some of that research, but I think there's a kind of an open territory for people who want to do formal verification research. And there are lots of other issues with specifications. OK, to wrap up, move programs hit the sweet spot for formal verification. The impact of bugs can be very costly, and move programs are relatively simple. So it's easier than some verification problems, and you know a lot of verification projects fail. So we're grateful for this. Starting with a clean state slate makes the problem a lot easier because we can affect the programming language and how programs are written. Our approach is a highly automated Floyd Hoare style verification. Move and the Libra blockchain create some unique issues and opportunities. And there are interesting challenges ahead, including better debugging, verifier predictability and reliability, and specification correctness and completeness. Thank you for your attention. I'm really grateful for an opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, David, for this uh, exciting talk. Um, I personally learned a lot today, uh, and uh, I'm sure there will be lots of questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand, and then when I call your name, please unmute yourself and uh, ask it. So questions? All right, so, so while um, people are thinking, let me um, ask the first question. Um, about kind of move beyond uh, blockchain, right? So, so, so it seems that you have um, a sweet spot in, ter in terms of um, kind of making verification problems somewhat easier with move. Uh, so, uh, but that that probably makes for limited applicability of move. So, do you have an an, an intuition? So, where move? To which kinds of problems is move appropriate and for which it may not be appropriate? I think what will happen, I you know, I think we would love to find a wider range of applications for move uh, because the more lines of code, you know, if you want to have a successful language, you want to maximize your impact, of course. And we're hoping that we can make move something that you never write a move program without verifying it, which would be really exciting for people in our domain. Um, uh, the language is, you're right, 
quite limited right now. So for example, we don't have maps except for vectors. Um, because of the very restrictive model of references, we can't have uh, cyclic data structures, uh, for example. So I'm sure that it would need to be extended for other applications. And so right now our first priority is to be able to use it with Libra. And perhaps there will be more applications on Libra. Uh, we don't know what the plan is there, but um, uh, I don't really know the answer to your question. The, the, the two, um, or the complete answer, the, the two things about uh, maps and other data structures and uh, being able to do things with cycles would be the first obvious limitations. Thank you. Um, any any other uh, questions? I don't see any other questions. Or all right, uh, Anyan, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the impressive talk. And I have a question. As my understanding to zero move prover, we need to specify our specification as logical formulas. And I confuse us how to prove the current needs of our formula, our logical formulas, because it is still to prove the current needs of our implementations, right? Oh, yes. Mm. Well, um, the way I've always thought about verification is that uh, you're comparing two descriptions of the same thing. So the program or the system that you're verifying is one description and the specification is a second description. And if they're different, you need to understand why and fix it. So sometimes you find a bug in the code because the difference is because there's a bug in the code and the specification is correct. Sometimes the problem is that the specification is wrong and the code is correct. And in my experience with a bunch of different verification systems, you spend as much time debugging the specifications as you do the code. So that's part of the correctness pro problem. Now, uh, a few steps back, uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can get there quickly enough, but um, I talked about the 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 worries about specifications, mm. uh, false positives and false negatives, um, and so when you're debug, you can debug the specification if you have a false positive. So if you get an error back when you try to verify it, the real problem is debugging false negatives, and I don't have a super good answer to that. Uh, we had an intern over the summer doing some research in ways to look for completeness, uh, incompleteness of specifications <clears throat> or trivial specifications. Um, and I had a few examples of mistakes I had made that we could catch after he did some work on that. But um, I think there's a lot of research to be done on that problem. Oh yeah, thank you so much. More questions? All right, so who's first, uh, Lina? Hi, uh, thanks you, thank you very much for the nice talk. So you mentioned in the talk that you, um, you mostly focused on uh, access control invariants. So I'm wondering if uh, there are other kinds of invariants that you would like to capture and uh, or do you expect to have uh, other kinds of invariants in the future? Yeah, um, so uh, we have a lot of, there, there are a lot of other invariants. The, the thing that I discovered about access control is it's easier to explain to other people, right? right? So we went through a process of looking at the code and talking to the authors of the code and thinking and coming up with specifications. But the wonderful thing about the access control was, you know, somebody thought about what the requirements should be separately from the code and made up that spreadsheet. So we could just look at that and, and uh, derive the specifications from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a lot of, um, you know, we, we, we're sort of noticing patterns that we generate. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember the, the very best invariant that I saw, but um, there are a lot of invariants that have to do with initialization. Um, so it's similar to the one I showed you about every time you have an account, you also have a role. So mm -hmm. there are setup functions that will create a bunch of related data structures. And then for the code to work correctly, 
uh, all of those data structures have to be present together. And so that becomes an invariant. And then um, the the other example I gave you is very typical, and it's not just used for access control, that once something is stored at an address, it stays there forever. So that's true of some of the things that are stored at addresses, but not everything. Um, so those are the ones I can most obviously remember. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, um, I can't randomly access the, the various properties yeah, that we no put problem. in the system, but those are the Thanks. ones that spring to mind. Thank you. Uh, Julien? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, dear, for the excellent talk. So I, I want to ask you, uh, you said, uh, which, which kind of series are you using for SMT servers? Somehow you generate many formulas. Which series are you using normally? And which oh, which series? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's quite an interesting question, actually. Um, uh, could you could somebody mute? There's some background noise here. Um, so um, we're using integers. Um, we should be using bit vectors because there are bit vector operations, but we're not supporting those yet. So we were, we started using integers and we haven't converted over to bit vectors, and I'm not sure if we're going to. Um, we're using one of the big problems we have is uh, lack of finite vector support in most decision procedures. So we're trying to use arrays to model vectors, but that turns out to be um, a worse fit than you would think. So we have lots of inefficiencies and complex encodings because we're using arrays to represent finite vectors. Um, let's see, we're actually, we're using recursive data types uh, because we're doing the, in the, the boogie model, we're kind of doing a version of runtime type checking. And so we, um, we we have uh, data type declarations in order to represent everything at runtime that we need to. So we are working with the University of Iowa and with Clark Barrett on trying to use sequence theories in, um, in for our vectors, uh, but that's not efficient enough yet. Uh, Z3 has a built-in sequence theory, but we found that it's extremely inefficient. And so the people at the University of Iowa are trying to develop a better one. So um, that I think covers the major decision procedures that we're using. Yes, thank you. So uh, maybe a related question is that uh, somehow with when you, you generated the many uh, formulas or benchmarks, uh, can can these benchmarks can be used for SMT server community? Somehow can you contribute? Uh, some benchmarks to the SMT uh, solver computation? Yes, um, that's a great question. And uh, I agree, you know, people who want to have their SMT problem solved should contribute benchmarks so other people can work on solving them. Um, so uh, we haven't really done it yet. So in working with uh, Clark and the University of Iowa, we sent them a bunch of benchmarks. In fact, since everything is open source, it's really easy to do that. Um, and basically anybody can go in and try and run the verifier in theory. It just requires a bit of skill. And so it might be better for us to take hard examples and save them. Um, so it's just a matter of us doing the work, I think. One of the silly problems we have there is that I'll, have, I'll run into something that's, that's hard, that the solver can't solve. And then I'll try it again the next day and the solver can solve it because somebody's changed something in the system or because of the instability I was talking about. So you almost have to take a snapshot of the whole system in order to find uh, consistently difficult examples. But uh, I think we should generate those benchmarks and I, I predict that, I'm not gonna promise that we'll do it, but I hope that we will, I, I plan to. Thank you. Costis? We can't hear you, uh, but then, okay, there is a question. Okay, so let me read the, the, the question in the, in the chat. So out of curiosity, since you were starting from a clean slate and decided to copy, to have copying semantics, why didn't you go for a functional programming language or more functional programming like for Move? So, 
Um, first of all, um, Sam Blackshear is really the, the the guy who conceived of move in its current form. So I I don't even know all the reasons for the combination of decisions that were made. I personally prefer imperative languages to some extent, uh, although the aliasing problems are very bad. You know, if we tried to verify something like ML, uh, my feeling is that uh, there's such heavy use, you know, you basically can't escape using higher order functions for lots of stuff. And I expect that they would create verification problems for SMT based solvers. Um, but I'm not sure of that. It could be that that other people have a have some solutions to those things. So I think, you know, language design is a tricky business and you have you make a few decisions and then uh, many other decisions cascade from those. And I, I'm, you know, if you were to go back up and try it again, you might do it differently. But um, that's the best explanation I have. So I think, you know, uh, languages like Rust, we, we stole some ideas from Rust. And I think this uh, borrow checking idea does give you imperative languages that have some of the attributes of functional languages and uh, imperative languages have have features as well. Uh, thank you. I don't see any more raised hands. And so let me abuse my privilege as chair and ask the last question. So uh, again, thinking about future. Uh, so so right now you are verifying the standard library and you mentioned the concern about completeness of, of specification. <coughs> Once you open it up for users to uh, write specifications of um, of, of their uh, of their code, uh, kind of do you expect to run into problems when when they say, okay, so I have this specification and I need to, you know, assume a in certain invariant in the standard library, which I'm sure is there, but you didn't prove it, and uh, do you anticipate these kinds of problems? Uh, uh, and and whether you have a strategy for dealing with it. Um, well, I think, yeah, no, I, I haven't. I mean, certainly we have run into those problems ourselves where in order to prove something, we need to have a more basic invariant somewhere else. Um, I haven't thought about how somebody suppose. So I think the scenario is somebody writes a different a new module. And in order to prove the correctness of the new module, they need a diff additional proofs of things in the standard library. Um, it seems like it's not a difficult research problem. You just need the ability, you know, we, we've already talked about whether we should have our specifications in completely separate files um, from the, uh, the standard library. And so if somebody could just add their own specifications and say, in addition to what you've proved of one of your standard modules, I want to prove these additional things. I don't see why that would would be particularly difficult to implement. In fact, the current system might uh, allow ways to do that. Very nice. Um, I, I, I like it. So so let me thank you again for uh, for the exciting talk. Uh, what we're missing with the uh, this uh, digital uh, this this um, uh, remote format is the roaring applause that you would be hearing right now if we were <laughs> all here in person. Uh, so sorry about that, uh, and and thanks again. And I guess in the interest of time, let me keep control back to the uh, organizers. I guess we are in the break now. Thanks everybody. Thanks David. Thank you.